Good morning. Welcome to church. It's great to join you in your lounge rooms today, coming from our lounge rooms once again. We're really looking forward to bringing God's word and worship and communion to you today. This morning, we're going to hear from a panel as we discuss Ephesians chapter 5, which is a little bit of a tricky chapter. And so we're really looking forward to hearing from some of our staff, our team, as they bring and discuss God's word together. Before we do, I wanted to just take a few moments to remind you that our playgroup, uh, Little Lambs, is continuing even through ISO. They're meeting online and they have a special gathering uh, that's a closed Facebook where they do stories and where they connect with one another. And if you haven't been involved in a playgroup and you're looking for something for your little ones to do, or you've got grandchildren and children that might need your grandchildren to have something to do, uh, get in touch with the office and we'd love to put you in touch with our playgroup coordinator, Melissa, who will organise uh, and enable you to join the playgroup. It's a great opportunity to meet other mums and through ISO, we all need a little bit of support. So I really encourage you to get involved in that. The other thing I wanted to share with you this morning is that we're really excited to announce to you that we have been approved by the elders to run a Friday community meal every week from the Bayswater campus. Bayswater's got a long history of community meals and though it was on a break for a while, we are relaunching these meals because of this time of crisis. In actual fact, it's one of the only face-to-face -face kind of activities we can do during ISO. So the meals are made by Hannah Rouse and her team, and then they're given as a takeaway to anybody in need. Uh, and if you're interested in being part of this program, if you'd like to pray for it, if you'd like to support it or financially get behind it, we'd really encourage you to do so. We think that this is one of the best ways our church can continue to serve the community in the midst of this very strange year. We want to take some time to thank you again to those who continue to give online. We acknowledge that this is a uh, difficult time financially for many people, and yet many of you have been able to continue to give, and we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for your faithfulness to God, and we are praying that as you give to him, that he will continue to bless you and give you all that you need, as he says in Corinthians, so that you can continue to give. May God bless you as you give. And uh, if you haven't been giving and you want to, you can check out the number that's coming up on our screen. That's our bank details you can give to, or you can hop on the website and give that way too. Well, before we begin this morning, let's take some time to pray. Let's center ourselves and remember who our God is and who we are to him. Heavenly Father, true Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we come before you intentionally. We know you're always with us, but we come before you intentionally and open our hearts towards you, turn our faces towards you, and acknowledge that you are turning your face towards us. There are many things that worry us. There are many things that weigh heavily on our hearts in this season. And in this moment, without being able to name them all out loud, each one of you brings before you the things that are at the top of our list that weigh us down. We offer you these things, knowing that you are the Good Shepherd, knowing that you are the carer of our souls, knowing that you are able to do more than we ask or imagine, knowing you are faithful. And we offer these things to you, Lord Jesus, asking that you will do your mighty work, that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We particularly continue to lift up our leaders in this nation. We lift up our medical heroes in this nation, strangers, friends and family. We offer to you, Lord God, these wonderful people and ask that you will empower each one with wisdom and protection. We pray for teachers, for parents and children. 
that you will bless each one also in this difficult time. Uphold them, sustain them, strengthen them, and allow them to experience your love, your grace and your mercy, we pray. And for our elderly, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would stand with them, that the God of angel armies would be by their side and that would feel and sense his protection, love and grace. And now we offer ourselves ready to worship. We invite you to come, Lord Jesus. Come into our heart and our soul afresh. Blow by your spirit. Open us up to know your ways. Help us to learn, to grow, and to walk a closer walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great day. We're looking forward to sharing this service with you, and we'll see you next week.
welcome to communion today. As I was sitting and thinking about what to do for communion today, I was thinking about the table. What does your table look like at the moment in lockdown? I know at the moment ours is covered in Lego and junk mail. There's a printer out so Hannah can print some of her work for school. There's also a couple of other bits and pieces and you know it's a kitchen table so everything gets thrown on it. But I was thinking about what would the table have been like when Jesus was having his meal with his friends, his Passover meal, the meal that we call the Last Supper and we, we remember when we do communion every week. His table would have been full of food at one stage during the Passover meal. It was a banquet, it was a feast, it was a remembrance of God giving um, so many things and helping them be released from slavery and I guess when we come around the table we remember that Jesus was also letting his friends know that he was releasing them from a form of slavery as well he was releasing them from their sins from their disconnection from God he'd been spending three years with these people he developed strong relationships and he was submitting to them. He was serving them. He was giving everything of all he was to them. And he was talking to them in the Last Supper about how he was going to give absolutely everything for them. He was going to give his life, his life for us, for them, for the ones that he loves. So when we come to the table and we look at the table and we see tiny little things, we see little cups, we see little bickies, they actually represent something really big. They might be small, the things that we look at, but the all-encompassing big picture is huge. Jesus came for us, he came to release us from the things that were holding us back from being the people that he wanted us to be. So as we take communion, and remember that these things are little, but they mean big. So take the biscuit, the bun, the cake, whatever it is you have, and remember that this represents his body that was broken for us. The water, the lemonade, the tea, whatever it is you have, remember that this is the thing the blood that he spilled for us it wasn't a beautiful it wasn't PG it was something that was huge it was something that was sad and his friends had to see this but as we remember this time and we remember the things that God has given us in this remember that he gave his all for us and we can give a little bit back, I'm pretty sure. So let's pray and then we'll take these emblems together. God, we thank you so much that you are there for us. And we thank you that even in these little emblems, something really big is represented. And we thank you for your servanthood and for your love for us and the way that you showed us how to live. So God, Please be with us as we take these emblems, as we remember you. Amen. So let's take the biscuit together. we thank you that we can take whatever it is juice or water or wine or whatever it is we might be taking today to remember you and we thank you that we can do this wherever we are whether we're outside in our garden whether we're inside in the warm God we thank you for everything you do let us drink So may God bless you as you go out this week. 
And may you remember that even the little things can represent something huge in our life. See you later. Good morning. Church is coming to you from our lounge room to yours today. And we're really excited to bring to you a panel which are going to bring God's word to you. So if, if you can see the screen like I can, you will see Drew Nichols. He's our Bayswater Interim Minister. You'll see Tanya Rose. She's our Kids Minister. You'll see Richard Brown. 
who's our on-call pastoral care and seniors minister. So great to have you guys. And I'm Becky Scott, and we're going to bring to you today's word. And um, it's pretty exciting to be able to meet like this, guys, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we're all social distancing, we're all taking care to make sure we stay safe, just as we know you are, we're still able to gather and connect. And uh, so hopefully you're going to enjoy our panel time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring our reading and then we're just going to uh, work our way through a couple of questions this morning and, and hear from these guys, our experts. Is that right? Yep. Our experts <laughs> on Ephesians. <Yeah>? <laughs> all right. So I'm going to say that again. We'll try our best. Try your best. Well, that's all you can do, right? Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 1. And it says this. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And then skipping to verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you should also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Mm, this is a good reading for us. And uh, now you might understand why we've decided to tackle this in a conversation rather than just one expert sermon. So we're going to have a, a bit of a chat about all of these things. Um, and we want to address not just the things we read in Ephesians 5, but to acknowledge Ephesians 5 is a whole context and it's actually found in the whole book of Ephesians. And so as we talk today, we're not just going to be speaking to those verses, but to the whole context of what the message the Apostle Paul was trying to communicate to the Ephesian church. So, having said that, overall, my friends, what are you noticing in Chapter 5? What do you see? What do you hear? What are you noticing Paul is teaching his people? Tanya? Mm. I know, for me, whenever, whenever I hear this verse, though, um, I struggle so for me to see anything in it is really hard because it's quite a strong verse, um, quite a strong passage. But um, often we talk about it just being husband and wife, but it's not actually just husband and wife. There's God in this as well. And there's community as well and how we all live together. So that's what stands out to me in the verse, even yeah. though it does sort of trigger things from hearing sermons and that in the past that weren't always the best. I'll ask you about that a bit later because I, I think you're probably not the only one who has some reaction to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So you're saying this is a whole church. Uh, there's some teaching for the whole church in this. That's good. Really? So what, did you, what, what stood out to you? Yeah, look, it's, it's a very interesting one. And certainly this is um, a piece of scripture that has been uh, interpreted in, in a variety of different ways, both constructive and uh, deconstructive. Um, I think for me, the, the, the real sense I get is really from verse 21. And it reads like this, you know, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so I think if I'm sort of to reduce this down to one verse or one idea, I go, that's, that's the clinching point for us. It's around how do we partner and honour and work together as one body, one flesh, one married body together. 
Okay, that's great, great pick up there. What about you, Richard? What stood out to you as you've read this? Uh, it's a change in the relationship we have with each other, much the same as what Drew said and um, Tanya have. It's changing what is the norm for the time, whereas there is a strict hierarchy of yeah. relationships that exist between husband, wife, man, woman, parent, child, master, slave, as it goes on later on in the, in the book. And it's changing that all around, changing the dynamic, and it's bringing Christ in as the centre of it. Mm. I remember when we were talking about this, um, as we were preparing for this sermon, Richard, you said that women had, in society, had a particular place. What was the word you used about women? I referred to them as chattels, a little more than chattels, something that yeah. is owned and can be dealt with at the husband's or the male's whim. Yeah, and all the hairs on our necks stood up, right, ladies? Oh, yeah. But, you know, that's how society was in those days, Richard, wasn't it? That it women was, were yeah. traded and, and used um, in many ways. They weren't equal participants in society at all. No, they were almost less than human. Yeah. They yeah. were uh, and, and necessary to procreate and, ex and grow the family to, to continue the lineage of the, the father's line. Yeah, so, such a different view to how we would talk about humanity today, but it still reminds us that just as there was injustice in those days, there continues to be uh, injustices in our day. Maybe it's um, not always about women now, but perhaps it's about the way we treat others that are different to us, whether it's um, race or culture or religion, or perhaps it's to do with age or um, abilities. But yeah. there still are some of those injustices and you're right, the Apostle Paul is really tackling this. And this is the first turn, really, of the key to women's equality in history. You know, this, this sentence to love your wife, this, that's a change in history. And it's the work of Jesus Christ, actually, that brought that about in history. So, so we, that's a really great. We've had a really good start then as we've observed this. Let me ask you the next question. The first verse was be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering. How does this read into the text that we read, but the earlier part of the passage as well, which kind of talks about, you know, don't let um, obscene talk come out of your mouth, don't chase greed, you know, live a life that is um, full of thanksgiving to God. You know, what do you think's going on as he talks about being an imitator of God? And what, where's he going with all of this in the chapter, do you think? Who's that directed to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Open-ended. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, God was prepared to give his all for the people he created. He gave his son. Um, his son was an example of his love and how to love. And mm. that's what we've been called to do, is to love as he is loved, as he is, we are, we are loved by him and uh, God loves us. So we are to be exemplars of that love to other people in and relationships. Richard, in the Old Testament, there were laws around this, weren't there? How to love people, there were laws. What were they? You're a man of law, a lawyer, okay? <laughs> there were lots of laws. Um, the relationship you have with one another. You start with the Ten Commandments, for instance, the, the do not kill, do not steal, do not covet, do not bear false witness um, on your mother and father. So they're all, all relational, there. really, aren't they? Yeah, yeah they're all, all relational. Don't commit adultery. Um, it's not good you for your relationship. Around. Sorry? It's not good for your relationship. <laughs> no, it's not, <laughs> definitely not. And then as time went on, they expanded on them to really can find different ways of relating to each other and particularly intimate relationship as a man and a wife and how women must be queen and you can't interact with a woman who's unclean. Um, so, so there were these really incredible laws. Did the laws make a difference? I mean, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and then the Pentateuch, which kind of included the law, yeah. did, it, did it work? I don't think it worked. That was 
ideal at the start that then man got involved, humans got involved with, with the law, um, changed it from God's law to man's law. And from law to legislation, is that right? That's right, yeah. Um, yeah. Loophole. And as any good lawyer knows, we try and work our way through the loopholes. <laughs> and every time we found a loophole, someone tried to close it up. So that, that's the way we work as humans. We try to try and get around it, even with the way we live today and these strange times, people are always trying to find ways to work around the restrictions we've been given or put into. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. And, and yet the, the verse says, be imitators of Christ, live a life of love just as he loved and gave yeah. himself up. So then, you know, as we pause on that, what, what is Paul at? Or, you know, we assume Paul wrote Ephesians for today's purposes. What, where is he going with this verse? What does he really want out of us? He wants us to be imitators of Christ. He wants us to be the light to the rest of the world. Um, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a student of law and history and uh, knew the Ten Commandments, knew all the laws and regulations, and he knew the prophets as well. And when you look at Isaiah, in particular 42, 6, 49, 6 and 63, um, the Messiah or God's servant is described as a light to the Gentiles. Here he's writing a letter to the Gentiles asking them to live as children of light. Mm. Under and the light and of Jesus Christ. says that too, doesn't he? He says, I'm the light of the world mm. and you are the light of the world. The mandate passes on to the people of God, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Christ is no longer here. We have to take on that role of being a light, drawing people to into a loving relationship with God. Yeah. So then, I mean, I've seen Drew nodding along here. You know, what for you then is in this? What happens for you as you hear be imitators, live a life of love? What are you thinking as you're hearing that? Well, it's 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 really interesting because when we when we read letters like this, it's it's a it's a letter to a church, and so um, certainly Paul didn't write it to have you know all the different chapters. You know, he didn't put those in, yeah. um, and so I guess in my mind, I, I go back a little bit further, and so I go to verse four. Uh, uh, sorry, rather right, chapter four, um, and you know we've just gone over this. You know, it's all about unity, and Paul talks about you know there is there's one God, one faith, one baptism. You know this. This language, this description is all about how, like, what does unity actually look like? What is, and, and the reason for being reminded of this is because this is what it means to be the new creation, what it means to be the people of God. And so Paul goes from that, he just talks about a couple of different other things, and then he goes into, so what does the household look like? And so for me, that, that's where we begin, isn't it? That's, it is that sense of how do we work together in unity in a way in which doesn't create discord, but actually brings us together. Um, and so certainly um, some of the imagery that, that Paul uses in this context, you know, he's, he's marrying up images of Jesus and the church and how they are married together and how they honour and respect one another. And that's the example really that's given around how to, how to couples, how to families and indeed slaves who are part of that uh, family structure, how do they work together? Yeah. How do they work together in unity? Yeah. And, and really that idea of imitating Christ is that his, um, you know, Paul tackles this in uh, Philippians, doesn't he, where he says he didn't grasp being equal with God, but he took on the form of a servant. So there's this real um, invitation. If we're going to be an imitator of Christ, we actually have to take on the nature of Christ. We are like his children is, is also the phrase, isn't it? As God's children, imitate. Be like your father. Be like Christ Jesus in the way you act. This is kind of a decision that produces the unity you're talking about. It's good. Is there something, Tanya, you want to add for this question? Yeah, it was interesting as I was listening to what Drew was saying. He was talking about discord and um it's like Jesus came and turned everything on its head. And it's like Paul is just reiterating what it is that Jesus spoke about. And that what it is, is there's actually a cross-cultural um, cost here. And we've got things that they have always done a particular way and we're turning it on its head. And I guess as we look at uh, even today in the world, there's still places where things need to be turned on their head. Yeah. And even within our own churches and communities and households, um, there's still things that 
we might go, oh yeah, we're pretty equal, but really are we? That's the thing. Mm. Yeah. It's great. It's that justice element. The justice element. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that's an ongoing work of God in our society, isn't it? Yeah. Through his people as we gain his revelation. It's good. All right. Let me let me ask you a question. It's not exactly from the text. This question is goes like this. When you read wives submit to your husbands or husbands love your wives, do you have a reaction and what is it? <laughs> yeah, come on. My Daniel. best one is actually the laugh. <laughs> the laugh. I'm sorry, but it's um but it's because there are actually so many different emotions and things within that one statement. Um, mm. Growing up as a female, uh, sometimes you're not given the same opportunities because of, you know, you are born a woman. Um, and then it's the same within churches. And then, you know, sometimes I expect you to, you know, when you get married, you'll have kids and you'll stay home and you'll do what your husband says to do. Um, but the idea of submission is so different. Um, and for me, I actually, um, I read the verse in the message mm -hmm. because for me, language is a huge thing and how we communicate with each other. And in the, in the message, it's talking about um, wives understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. So it's, it's not just this, you have to do this for your husband. It's this, you know, you love this person, you love this person as yourself. Mm. And hopefully you're loving yourself well as well. Mm. That's the thing. Are you loving yourself well? Are you doing what? Are you helping your husband, your partner, be the best they can be? And that's basically it. Not this not these sermons that I listened to as I was growing up in the church, <laughs> you know, you be good to your husband or, you know, Who's make your sure dinner's on time and, you know, it's as quick as yeah. 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 I, I might, I might have some of my own reactions to these words. They're funny. They're trigger words. They're powerful. Yeah. They come back to you even after years of not reading them through the lens. Maybe I read them as a kid and I heard them as a kid. Um, and I saw played out in the church culture yeah. as a kid, and yet I still find they they trigger me when I read them and <laughs> when I talk over them a little bit. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that that God actually has something more to say. Uh, his His intention with these passages is not abuse. So we have to yeah. look then for the deeper magic. What is God's deep? Uh, you know, I use that word in the context of what C.S. Lewis said. You know, there's a Sometimes we look on the face value, we'll look to the deeper magic written before the foundations of the earth. What is God up to? What is he saying that we need to hear him saying that will actually call us to be imitators of Christ oh. and live a life of love? Yeah, so that's good. What is, what is the big story? Yeah, yeah. And to really... Look at the little bits. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's yeah. great. Um, Drew or Richard, do you guys have some thoughts? I mean, Tanya and I probably dominated this because we've got a personal, um, you know, an interest, a vested interest in this, <laughs> as you can imagine. But but you guys might have some thoughts too. Um, not obviously not the same as you. Um, I saw it as a, uh, as I said, changing of behaviours in which the wife previously would have been submissive, subservient to the husband. Yeah. Whereas the wife, although she, Paul says submit to the husband, but there's a counter submission on the part of the husband. He's got to love the wife. He has to earn that submission. If if you want to use the term submission or honour, respect, mm. um, so that they can form a unit, a mm. uni unified approach to life as children of God. Yeah, so so we'll come back to that in, in just a sec because I think that's the key we're going to end with. I think we that's where we're going to come back to. What is this? We started with that idea of, you know, one church, one God, children of the light, the people of God, the children of God. And I think we're going to end 
and understand there's a there's bookends in this space that we can really find. Um, before we do, Drew, how, did you see this play out in your church um, life growing up, or have you experienced a different kind of um, read on this passage? Yeah, Being look, the good youngest question. in our group. <laughs> Just um, <laughs> look, I think. I mean, I I grew up within Churches of Christ. Um, I grew up in a in a in a family where. Uh, definitely both parents they they were partners in crime if i may um they were you know they they were in it together and certainly the way Leah and i operate we certainly don't operate around any imbalance at all we we definitely see ourselves as both being uh, partners in marriage and so um for for me there was growing up there was never any sense of imbalance between men and women um certainly it, it wasn't displayed at home um that wasn't at all to suggest that it didn't happen anywhere else. But um, certainly for for me and, and with my training, when, when I've gone back into reading uh, this bit of scripture a bit further, it is it is quite fascinating. I mean, it is a bit of scripture that comes up quite often in, um, it's listed as the household code. So it's it comes up in Colossians, it comes up in uh, Philippians. Um, so it's certainly not something that's just reduced to the church in Ephesus. Um, but really, yeah, I'm, I, I don't know whether you want me to get it into that <laughs> at this point in time, but it, it, it does come from a patriarchal context. It does come from a very different culture that we find ourselves in now. And so that's, that's always really helpful to keep in mind when reading the scripture. When Paul's writing, as he does with all of his writing, he observes the culture he's in and he references it because it's contextual, it helps people apply. So when he talks about put on the armour of God, which I think is next week's passage. We're looking forward to that from Simon. He's chained between soldiers in captivity, saying put on the armour, and he's looking at the soldiers and he's got visual um, context that he's using that is their culture. Now, we don't see soldiers very often and, you know, the most armoured up people we might see are cricketers or, you know, ice hockey players or, you know, whatever, where people um, armour up for sport. But for their context and culture, they would use what was nearby. And certainly, you're right, the culture was very patriarchal. And in, in many ways, Richard is saying, this is where it flips. This is where husbands were never invited, instructed to love their wives, ever. Mm. And here, Paul says, in the name of Jesus, if you're imitating Christ, you're actually changing your behaviour at the very core relationship that you have in marriage. Um, and it's critical. And, and wives who were never really required to be submissive, they just were chattel. It wasn't, it wasn't their um, way of thinking that I must do this to please him like it was a 1950s housewife. Um, they, their cooperation, the submission was about a willingness to serve out of the spirit of Christ, that we, we go actually above and beyond in serving and caring as Christ did for us, you know, in our staff meeting, we talked about do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. There's this real understanding that actually just as Christ has loved us, we return that love, we serve. As he's been generous, we are generous. As he is a servant, we are a servant. And that, that's a real difference to just doing your job as a wife in those days as chattel. You know, she was doing it with a spirit of emotion and intention rather than um, just because she had to. So yeah. there, I think there's some really big shifts there, which is good and exciting for those of us who grew up with this as like the household value system. So that's how I grew up. Household code is one way of saying it. Social structure is another way. In my household, I came away thinking it's about who's the best to who's the worst. Mm. You know, the men are the best, the women are, and kids, and, you know, and I was a women kid. So I was, you know, right towards the bottom, not a slave though, not Cinderella. So, um, you know. I'll just say something. Yeah, go on. A lot of people would see submission as being subservient. Mm. Um, what I've picked up on this is it's not that at all. It's a giving up of self. Yeah. And not mm. a letting go of self as such, but yeah. a vehicle to grow self in the relationship. I would say to some people, God forms us into the image of his son by the rigour of our relationship. 
<laughs> it's true, isn't it? The people that we live with that rub against us, that's <laughs> where God's best formation actually takes place. But in lockdown, that. in lockdown at the moment, it's so harmonious. It's amazing. <laughs> <In your house. laughs> uh, I grew up in a family as well that mum and dad pretty much were, you know, equal partners and everything. Um, and coming from my mum's side of the family is actually quite matriarchal. So for me to see that written down, like someone like Paul writing it that long ago, it, it just does trigger. And I know there would be people out there that this triggers for them as well, because there's some people that use it for, you know, for violence and things yeah. like that against their wife. And I think we need to remember that as well. Um, that there's those out there that, you know, don't always read the Bible the way that it really should be read. Yeah. But thank you. That's such a good and important sentence because you're exactly right. Yeah. It has been used not just as a verbal kind of talk down to people, no. like maybe we've observed or even an unconscious or subconscious, you know, expression, but people have deliberately used these verses to control, um, manipulate, overpower uh, yeah. their wives and children. and. Uh, and that is not what this passage is saying. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you are in a situation like that, you know, can I say to you, that's not what God is saying. God is wanting health and wholeness, the peace and the shalom, the unity of God. And that doesn't come from violence and control. And always God's activity around redemption is his activity of surrender, his activity of um, servanthood, his activity of laying down his life extending his love not um, dominating and controlling and beating down and uh, we're happy if you want to give us a ring or send us an email if you need to talk through some of that stuff also we could really encourage you to get in touch with our government services thanks tanya really important pick up in the, in the conversation today so if we had one last pick up around this you know and i say is this a social structure or is it the key to unity? Is it the bookend to this one God, one faith, one hope in, in chapter four and also be imitators of God? What would your one, you know, one comment around this be? I'll start with Richard, then I'll go Tanya, then I'll go Drew. It's a, a key to unity. Yeah. It's a partnership with people working together for the common good. That's awesome. You said to us the other day, Richard, when we were thinking this through, you read, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and if cleave that, to and his be, wife. Be united as to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So it's a becoming united, yeah. uh, uh, one unit working together for the common good, their common good and the common good of the church. Yeah, and beautiful. It's such a God. really important pick up, isn't it, in the midst of this conversation. This is about unity. I love that. Thank you. Tanya? Uh, for me, I think it's actually a message to the church as a whole um, in working together as a community and um, that it's how we treat each other and give respect to each other and all that sort of thing. How do you live your life and how do you serve the others around you? That's mm -hmm. what I see. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Drew? Yeah, look, um, indeed it was Jesus who spoke about us as people, as the new creation, that we will be known by our love and how we operate out of that love. Um, and so scripture like this is, for me, just a, a really helpful reminder that we are called to be radically different from the world around us. And we are called to, just like Jesus on the cross, lay down our lives for one another um, because our love is deep, our love is great. And um, just as Richard said, that is what becoming two, you know, two people coming together, that is what that is about. And that is what the family should be. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I think for me uh, too, it is, you, you guys have really covered this topic so well and, and understood it so well. For me, it is that great expression of how does this stuff play out in our life, this invitation to be children of the light, to be God's children, to experience a full measure of his life, how wide and deep and you know, all of those things we've been talking about over the weeks. How does that play out in our families? Um, but it also, I don't think this is a condemnation when we haven't got it right. It's the invitation to come further up and further in in following Christ, to continue to imitate 
as we learn his love and to pass that on. And I think the older we get, um, maybe the more we can understand and experience what it is that unifiedness as we let go of ourselves. I think the Romans 12 passage, you know, present your bodies as living sacrifices, really plays into this passage in many ways as we are filled with God's love and we pass it on by sacrificing ourselves. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, I think you guys are just fabulous. I love how much you've been engaged with the text and enjoyed um, what is known to be as a tricky text and yet really being able to find what is this, what is God's intent, what's his heart for us as the people of God as we um, look at this passage and as we seek to live at peace in our home and at unity in our home as well as in our church, especially during lockdown. Okay, so I'm going to just pray and then I'm going to bless you guys because you're with me and you guys because you're with us and, um, and then we'll close our service. Heavenly Father, how great it is when we gather together in the name of Jesus and find, even if we're not in the same room, that he is with us and amongst us. And today as we have gathered in his name, we have explored this passage in community and you've led us to an understanding of unity and of humility and of the love of Christ. And we want to be children of the light children of God, imitators of Christ, wherever we are in the midst of this lockdown, we want to honour you. We want to live this life. We thank you that you give us your Holy Spirit who produces this fruit in us. It's not our own effort. It's not our own works of righteousness. It's your grace at work in us. And so we afresh invite you to gift us with your seeds of grace and your seeds of fruit for the Holy Spirit. Come breathe in us again, we pray. And Lord, would you bless us. Bless our homes, our families, our friendships. Bless our relationships. As we seek not to obey the law, but to have your laws, your ways written on our heart by your Holy Spirit. That we might please you, bring glory to you, and be participants in bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So bless us, Lord, and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lift up your countenance towards us and give us peace. Amen. Thanks so much for joining with us today. My God bless you as you go on into your week this week. And may you be an imitator of Christ and live a life of love just as we do for you. And welcome to church this morning. Um, our service this morning, sorry. Good morning. We'd love to join with you this morning to share our service. So I just have to think about what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry. And cut. <laughs> Amazing.